with um, President and CEO of Martindale Consulting coming to speak to us with um, increasing production value and um, he has Ms. Mia Downing and Jacob Higginbotham. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. When Susan first called me, she had asked us to talk about increasing production value. So what I'm going to give you a little background about myself, about one of the consultants. And I actually brought two of our young, bright managers who work for our farm. I'm going to let them talk about this subject. Um, what Martindale Consultants does, we've been around since 1982. And we provide accounting services, we provide joint venture compliance services uh, for a lot of our clients, whether it be royalty owners, whether it be producers, uh, and non-operated interests. Um, we pretty much do compliance audits, everything from the wellhead costs, production out of the wellhead, joint ventures between uh, parties who are in a gathering agreement, gathering arrangements, gas plant processing. So we look at a little bit of everything from wellhead to cells to the end of the, to the gas plant. What we put together here in this presentation is a little bit about talking in terms of the mineral agreement. You know, what, what adds value for a producer? You know, and, and what adds value for a mineral owner uh, through, the, through the mineral lease agreement? And I realize, you know, and the Osage Nation is probably under the ONR type regulations and all, but this this affects a lot of our state and, and how they add value through those two parties. And obviously, it's a it's a tug of war because the producer wants to be able to have more favorable terms for themselves, but the mineral imagine owner that. <laughs> they imagine that exactly. And of course, we're always on the other side of that, you know, typically protecting the mineral owner and. You know, helping them understand what provisions you should have in your agreement that are countering that, and also how do you make it easy for yourself? You know, we've we've actually audited some of these mineral agreements in, in other places in Texas and other areas where the mineral owner had a lot of strong language. Problem with it at the end of the day, very difficult for the producer to do, and because of that, you had a lot of angst between the parties. Am I being paid properly? How do I know if I'm being paid properly? And following the provisions of the rentals. So anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda and Jacob and let them do this presentation. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm Mia, as Roger had said. Um, definitely glad to be here. Well, I had the opportunity to speak uh, with another coworker at the um, Osage with the Osage Mineral Council about a, about a year, year and a half back. So. That was very interesting to see how um, the council worked and how they made decisions and, and the things that they considered in those meetings. So that was that was very informational and uh, actually a good opportunity to be a part of. So glad to to do another um, have another opportunity to be um, in front of the Osage Nation um, doing this presentation. So um, as you can tell, um, Rogers the senior manager since we're doing the Exactly. <laughs> uh, but we'll go ahead and get started on, on what we're going to cover today um, in this hour. Or so so in, uh, in, uh, an overview of what this presentation is going to cover is in, this an introduction on typical lease valuation terms. So I have not had the opportunity to actually lay my eyes on the mineral lease that the, that the Osage Nation enters into. So I don't have the specific knowledge of those specific royalty terms. We got to do a correction. The Osage Nation does not handle the leasing. You are not under honors here. You we are the only tribe with our own CFR federal code, and that stipulation that you saw at the council. This is my new council, so I want you, even though it might be a, a I want you to break it down for them. But uh, the we represent a group of people who still have the head right. And that's why I didn't want you to go off in the weeds about what the nation's going to do. This is my council here. We are the ones that signed the lease. Okay. So with Great. that, I just wanted that for your company here. Great. And I might, we have a very 
typical, typically worded lease. Okay. Uh, like, like any others. Okay. That's great. Uh, so you so you determine your own terms and your leases and all. All the above and below. Okay. Great. We, well, we return uh, term determine the lease and uh, the royalty rate. Okay. We get to determine okay. that. Okay. Uh, we have codes of federal regulations through the federal government that you know touch upon things leases do, but they're in the codes. So. Which are outdated. That's why we're all yeah, in this room with oh, you. Yeah, we're all working, yeah, we're all working on updating them. We're all working on making some of our own rules. That's so, great. Maybe, whatever we learn here, we might be able to take. Yeah. Thank you, dear. No, that's great because um, what the, the expertise and knowledge that we have is on leases that we've seen across the industry. So we're able to give you a little insight into into the leases and the language that um, that we've seen. You know, especially in, in this current current. Uh, industry you know the way the way that they're drilling for oil and gas these days there's a lot of things to consider when you when you negotiate those terms so. Um, so within the leases there are some very explicit lease terms that we're going to discuss um, it's laid out within the contract language of here's how royalties are going to be determined here's here's the value that you're going to receive when you sign this lease it's you know various components um, and it's explicitly laid out um, there are some implicit um, deductions that are occurring that aren't laid out in those lease terms. So um, this might be, you know, more on the line, more along the lines of usage, fuel usage, um, usage for gas, or, or what you know, whatever purposes they're needing it for, whether it's lease use, um, usage to fuel the compressors to get the production downstream, things of that nature. That's not necessarily um, laid out in those royalty terms on how they're going to handle that uh, production and, and whether or not you're going to receive value for that production. Um, and then we're going to discuss a little bit about transparency and special terms. So, um, you know, what what do um, what what would the, the nation ex like to expect from these producers as far as these terms? How transparent do you want them to be? You know, sometimes it's great to have the, the best terms, you know, as far as the highest price in the area, but is that how how difficult is that going to be to actually validate from from the from the nation's perspective. Uh, we, we can, we'll discuss this more later, but you know, I've, I've dealt with, particularly in, in Texas, some of the larger landowners down there. They have special terms that describe, you're not just getting checks to detail every month from the producer, you get basically a, enough to do a small desk audit every single month from the producer, so that you're not having to, it kind of puts us out of, <laughs> of a job, but you're not having to go hire people to go in and do big detail reviews. Uh, unless you see something from that information, so what kind of terms can you put in to ensure that you get all of that information up front? Okay, so how do your leases generate revenue? So there, there are specific provisions that, that the leases contain that, that will discuss um, various, the various terms on how they're going to value things. So as, for example, lease bonuses. That's generally you know, a specific provision very early on in the lease agreement that says here's the bonus that, that you're going to get paid just because, you know, you guys own the minerals. And these days you can see, I mean, the, the, the landowners are getting a little bit, definitely getting more sophisticated and more knowledgeable about the industry. So um, they're putting terms that are very favorable to them as far as getting those bonuses and, and as far as amount per acre. There is no such thing on us. No bonus? Okay. No, stay, don't correct me. Just okay. stay with me. <laughs> Landowner, that's why we're fighting 17 lawsuits. I, I've been on through councils. And we are now going to Supreme Court because of the rights that our trustee got us into. But the uh, landowner, unless they're a shareholder of Sage, they don't get any part of that, no except for the damages on fee simple. Um, the other important, important uh, provisions are royalties on production. So that's where the actual royalty provisions come in. That's the language that, that lays out for, for your products, for gas, could be casing hit gas, uh, for oil, for, you know, you might have provisions that are specific to if your gas gets processed. Um, there are provisions that will lay out how royalties will be determined for those products. Um, and then you've got your um, service damages, and then there's some other special terms that, that may be in there as far as getting um, 
the, the revenue out of those leases. And you know, on the, on the surface damages, you know, particularly if you if you own the surface, you know, we had a we had a client, Roger knows who I'm talking about, a big landowner in Texas, and they got in their lease, um, they got the same terms for surface damages that the the UT lands, the University of Texas land system was able to get because they own so much. Um, so much acreage down in the Eagle Bird. So some of this, as we'll see, is obviously going to be dependent on how much acreage you're talking about and how much negotiating power you end up having. Yeah, I might, and, and to help you kind of skip over this, just to be clear, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the landowner, uh, when you talk about doing a, a, a lease with a landowner, in Osage County, the lease is done with the Minerals Council. The landowner only does a surface damage lease with the, with the uh, uh, producer. So they're kind of out of the picture. We're very interested in what we can do as royalty owners to lease our, our minerals to the producer. But the landowner owner is just kind of off the side. Okay. He, he gets surface damages. He doesn't have anything to do with the lease. You know, it's a separate entity. We're the party that signs the lease. So, so for the majority of the mineral acres, but all of the tribe does does not own the surface. Well, no, we do own some surface. Some surface. And the BIA does uh, negotiate. Okay. Some of that. Okay. Well, fortunately, most of our presentation is geared towards the royalties okay. provisions. So. Uh, one, may I inter one quick question. May I interject there? Sure. But there's a lot of tribal members that are. Yes, and sir. Oh, oh, there there we go. Go. Yes. So, you know, we are affected, and and what our uh, OMC does for us is watch out for us too. They set the guidelines on damages and, and they're there and and locating with us and negotiating with producers. So, okay. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna ask a quick question here. Yes, sir. Um, who has water rights? We do. You do? Yeah, we're, see we're getting yes. tested now, and if I may, while you, I can't do it with five of our members in there, so. <laughs> what we're getting tested now is that we are in an environment that the large guys, and you're talking about the Bass Brothers, who we're, we're up in Kansas next to them, they were the reason that you had senators out there on Salt Creek, because we were there a week ahead of time, no one, and I told them you need to take do a certain protocol. The catch is, is that they're testing us now over environmental and other obligations of the United States government. Even the wind farm is a non-United States corporation that brought in all those tax credits for the state of Oklahoma and never permitted once with us. So they, they let the government let the tower throw the Osages under the driveway, but we still got our paperwork in time. They got to meet us December 11th in federal court and then try to negotiate something with us now after they attacked us uh, that they didn't have to. They didn't want to recognize the Osage. So they took us to federal court, paid off your last Secretary of Interior, and they never going to let them go on by. But every producer here has been held hostage by permit. But I, I, I want you all to know that because you're going you're going to fix this for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Only got an hour. <laughs> you don't even need that. Just keep going. Yes. <laughs> Basic, basic calculation is the royalty percentage that, that is negotiated times the value. And the value can vary from lease to lease. Um, you know, I don't know how the council tries, you know, how, how you want to draft up these agreements to, to be consistent across all agreements. I mean, I would expect that you would. Um, but, you know, as far as the industry is concerned, um, one lease can look very different from a lease in, in the same county. It, it's just very dependent on how that how it's negotiated. So the value in this case is normally somewhere between exactly what the lessee received and a higher value determined by specific provisions. So at best, you want what the producer is getting. What, what did they receive for the, for the production? So normally, you know, you would see something in between 
you know, that bottom value, here's what they receive, and something that, you know, between what you, what's negotiated. So there are various terms that you can put into the, to the agreement that will determine that. So the specific provisions can alter the value based on the royalty in ways that vary from the net dollars received by the lessee by tweaking these various components. So you can, within that lease language, you can tweak um, how you determine the gross value of one or more of the products, the type of deductions that are allowed, and taxes. Of these three, what I've seen in you know the last few years, a big, um, a big ticket item is deductions. What type of deductions are you willing to allow between well hidden sales? Um, are you going to allow across the board processing, transportation, gathering? Um, are you going to allow um, fuel usage for you know whatever purpose? Uh, those are just things to consider um, in drafting that language. Um, so in general, our, our main topic is how do we tailor and modify these lease terms to extract the most royalty value for the mineral owner? And I would assume that that's that's what the council is, is trying to do on behalf of all the shareholders. It's trying to get the most value out can out of the ground. So, at a basic level, and this is a this is kind of an oversimplification, but at a basic level, the normal royalty computation is at a at a well level. You're going to take gross value and you're going to subtract it off any any deductions, so gathering, compression, transportation fees, etc., and any taxes. You're going to get a net value, and that's going to be multiplied by the NRI or the mineral percentage, depending on if you own 100% of the participating acres in the well or not, um, and that generates the royalties. And so for this next little bit, we're going to talk about how the language surrounding that gross value component of the computation can be tweaked in order to increase value for, uh, for the royalty owner. Uh, so here's a couple, and, and me and I can kind of tackle each one of these. Um, like I said, since we, we go across multiple states and we see all, all varieties of mineral lease agreements, we have seen mineral lease agreements with gross values determined under any number of special terms from the, uh, the, the proceeds that the operator receives, uh, uh, an index-based price at its highest price in the area. Uh, what are so? Like for market value or in or price price in the area, what are some of the things you've seen? Uh, uh, so for market value, you're definitely just comparing to what a producer or other producers are getting in that area. You know, you want to get the value for your royalties. You want to you don't want to be anything less than than what everybody else is is could be getting in in that. It's generally in the same area. You want to be dealing with like, let's say for oil, for example. You want to deal with light grade and light quality, things of that, uh, those, those components you have to consider uh, when you determine market value um, or like a highest price in the area. That's, that's a little common, um, but on the flip side can be hard to validate um, for somebody, you know, when you come into a producer's office to determine are you getting the highest price in the area, um, who, you know, who's, who's producing in the area, what, that's, that's proprietary information sometimes to, to try to get to. So, but those are those are typical um, typical language that that we're seeing these days as far as gross value. And and you often see some of these in in concert with one another, where you wind up with either give me some kind of general market area or the higher of a general market value or whatever the operator received. Uh, so we did if, you know if the operator is bad at and negotiating prices, well, we don't want to be subject to their inability to negotiate a good sales contract. But if they are good, well, we definitely want the benefit of that. So we, we, there's usually, uh, and you know, I've even seen the same thing with, with index-based pricing on, on gas. So you might say, your sales price or, or NYMEX less three cents in an MBTU or some, something like that. And that just gives some variation and guarantee that the, the operator's inability to, to keep up with the market, um, that the royalty owner doesn't suffer as a result of that. So what you're saying that if we have a lease that says you have to pay this market value, 
then you need to explicitly define what market value is. Oh, and, and well, I think you're hitting on an important point. Defining your terms in a lease is stupendously important. And even when you define your, your terms, there can still be some ambiguities, but just leaving things open to interpretation, obviously the producer is going to interpret that in the most favorable, favorable terms to them, and the royalty owner is going to interpret that in the most favorable terms to them. But so that there's less of a chance of disagreement, definitely want to define market value. And I know like in Oklahoma, you know, in Texas, there's the you heard of market value at the mouth of the well language. That's a legal term down in Texas that means basically net back value. In Oklahoma, it's a little bit different, but you know, if you're going to use a term like market value, defining it as like a price reflective of the area versus what you were able to sell it for net of all costs is very important. Yep. Kind of following the market value piece. In our little pipeline, we put our gas on Southern Star and we sell it to continue. That's irrelevant of what the producer's gonna get or things of that nature. It just that's where it begins. Now, we don't really have continuum literally tells us this is what we're willing to pay you at that point. I, I guess I can use other uh, marketing folks to try to get a better price, but thus far we have been in we haven't been able to get a better price. We looked at combining even some of our gas with Kinder Morgan and maybe upping the volume for everybody in an effort to get more price. But so far, we haven't been able to do anything. So we, Newell Barker, this goes all the way back to Newell Barker, Susan, and, and he wanted to keep it simple, stupid. Um, his idea was 70-30 is where we ended up, and there's no transportation, there's no line loss, there's no Nothing. We just want to be paid 70% at the meter of the lease. And that's what the producer gets as well as the mineral owner gets. So my question would be, I'm open. How can we improve the price if ultimately we're, we're being set? Because our market is so limited. All of our gas around here is basically on Southern Star. It's the only way out. You might go to Superior, you might go to Keystone, you might go to Kinder Morgan, but everybody's got 11,000 miles to get out of here on the Southern Star Line. And, and we don't even get to, to, to go in and try to have two marketers bid against each other. We haven't been able to improve the market value that you're talking about for a couple of years. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I was just trying to, it's not that we don't want to increase it, we do, because the producers need more, the royalty needs more, and the little pipeline that we're sitting in the middle, we haven't made money in a long time. So everybody's frustrated with exactly what you're saying, market value. Yeah, and I know that that's, that's been, in, you know, there's kind of all over the area, I mean, down in, down in Texas, speaking of a lack of a, of a market, we just did a, a presentation on the oil side on uh, there's a lack of capacity down in the Permian, and we have people literally paying gatherers to take their gas. They're not even getting value for it. But in order to keep the oil flowing, they're having to pay basically a gathering fee and, and, and receive zero dollars. How does the mineral interest owner get paid when you when they have to pay for takeaway? That's, that's <laughs> that was a whole present. That was a whole hour. Of that, 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 Sorry, that, that, oh, we have time. Then you're right. We do um, because I love this topic. This this is one that our industry is struggling with in several different areas. Uh, one because in Texas. For instance, I, I hate to keep, you, keep using a, a place that doesn't necessarily apply here, but in a way it does. Yeah, we paid SMU and Our Lady of the Lake. Yeah, I want to hear it. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is, right, is you're going after the oil, you got casing head gas, you got nowhere to go with it. Texas, Texas allows you to flare for 30 days. No, 60 days. They will allow you to flare for 60 days, then you can get a final extension and you can flare for another 60 days. Once that's over, though, you either have to have a place to take your gas, which means you've got to have a market, or you're going to pay somebody to take it just so you can produce your $60 barrel oil, right? Because you're not going to shut the well in. You didn't spend $8 million on a well to drill it to shut it in. So you do that. 
Now you're under these mineral agreements that say you're going to pay me market value on the gas produced and stored. It doesn't say sold, it says produced. So if you're a producer, you're already hamstrung. I'm having to pay this person to take my gas so I can produce the oil so the mineral owner gets his share of that. But the mineral lease says not only do I have to pay him, I've got to pay the mineral owner too because the provision says you pay me on production, not on what you receive, so it doesn't matter. So that's the struggle a lot of producers are, are fighting right now in Texas because they're being harmed just to produce the oil. You know, how do you, now, obviously, Logic tells you as a producer, you go to your mental owner and you explain the facts and you go, well, the best thing I can do is I'm going to get you oil out of the ground and do this. i got to pay to take the gas. I just don't pay you anything, but you're not going to get deducted for it either. Now, we do have producers who are wanting to do that too. Well, i got to pay to take the gas. I want to deduct that from your oil. No, because if you look at the mental agreement, a lot of mental agreements say the cost of production is the cost of the producer. Well, Only. Huh? Only. Yeah. And which means, so if that's the case, if you're having to produce the gas and produce the oil, it almost becomes a cost of production. So then you're still in the same line where you had to pay to get the gas out of the way to get the oil out of the ground. So I mean, the producer, it's the way the mineral agreements were written. And that, that's kind of what we're talking about here is you got to be very clear in your terms on what you want to do with casing head gas, what you want to do with produce gas. It's not casing head gas, what you want to do with liquids, processing of all of that. What, happen, you know, what happens if you have a net negative? Um, I don't know if you know what that is happening. We view, we view our obligation as a lessee in OCH gas to meter the gas and pay it. We owe the minerals regardless of whether we can sell it or not sell it. If that gas is venting, we have to give the report once a month and we have to pay our loyalty as if it was sold, regardless of our problem, whether it got to market, it got sold, it, whatever. That's the way we view it, Susan. Is that, is that a code of federal regulation? I, I, I think it's in your lease. It's policy, it's so the superintendent, it's not in the lease. No. I just come off the RPC committee that they stopped by the lawsuit at the White House. That's exactly what we're getting in is the royalty value. But I happen to know his situation even better. And what it is is that you're correct on what you're handling. We need the list of the least terms, worst scenario. Every one of them's ours. We have a federal trustee negotiating our gas contract, forcing him to keep the production in, to keep our lease. And then you heard what he's having to do. And guess who gets to decide the value of the gas and the oil? Now, I want them to guess one time. Guess who's, who's sending that to our trustee? They called the purchaser. Three of them sat down. Not one person in this room has ever been in that meeting. So now you really know where we're at. However, we're getting ready to set some of our own rules. This would be good for us to understand the dilemma so we can go forward with the proper language in our new leases to, to work out something to cooperate with our producers who we depend on. They take all the risks, spend all the money, and write us a check, which we must never forget, and uh, find some kind of happy medium. Yeah. Is your charge to renegotiate all your existing leases as well? No. Or just I mean, the negotiate the leases, leases that are going there are going back to that Oh, those are things we have to work through. Yeah, I can answer it. Okay. Good. Yes, it is. But the interpretation of the superintendent, our trustee from the United States government, allows it and has been allowing it. No one in this room but me ever filed against the United States government, the Koch brothers, for $2.2 billion. So they get me out of office, get their guys in, and they settle. Now the Copeland book's going to bring it back up. Even the chiefs of that era are saying, well, we got to look at reports. Koch brothers sent us a report, said we owed them. <laughs> Yet I had four auditing. I did internal, external, three independents, and I had two accounting firms like yourself come in and generate my numbers. I'm positive they owed us over a billion, and then the rest of them owed us that much too. 
and we sent them for 360000 Koch brothers sent a check in after 17 years. How much of an interest they make off that billion for 17 years? So as I, I want you to go start my car when I get done, but that's about it. Because we're against Enel. You know who owns Enel? The Italians. They should have thought of that if they put it on print, what they said about us. Thank you. <laughs> it might be okay to her, but she didn't file it. That's, that's Johnny come lately. I've been on this since the 90s. So, I filed these suits. Yeah. Uh, so earlier, Wilson said that we're not getting market the highest market rate. And why is that? Because of the lease terms? Or is it because, um, why did he say that? What's we sued for highest posted price. Yeah, but he says we're not getting. He was the group that put it to settlement and put it in there with Trump's three and accepted a settlement. Now the BIA and government's going to turn around and make us eat that settlement. They're saying now that we can't have you guys come in and check it. We can't have Scott tell us what's happening. They're not going to allow it. Wait till NL gets us. You can't come to the purchaser and ask us to supply you with information? We're going to put it in the lease. Because we would. Well, I knew that, but the government's not going to make it because they don't want the answer. It, it's, going to, it's going to actually show them not doing their work. That money never did go away. Never did. And that, that, another reason I want this done is because you have my OC shareholders in this room. I don't mean the lucky ones. These are people that have had to go through a lot to be here. No other tribe has to bury their family to get an inheritance but the other side. And now you've got Scorsese who's going to make more money than we ever made off oil on a movie because DiCaprio's in it. That's what's going <laughs> Hey, I'm going to step out. You guys have got all the best I got. <laughs> I'll leave Christy and Susan. Well, uh, so kind of carrying on with the, on the Gross value side, one of the issues that we, we tend to run across fairly often is, you know, when we have labels like proceeds, gross proceeds, price received, it's important to consider who the purchaser is. And particularly if the purchaser is an affiliate of the lessee, which we run across this all the time, and this is always a source of contention. Um, and if the lease agreement is not explicit about how that's supposed to be you know, handled, and we'll do a quick example to, to demonstrate this, you can have what everyone at least initially signing understood to be the case, but now the lessee has some kind of argument that, oh yeah, actually certain costs are deductible because of X, Y, and Z. So we'll, we'll walk through this example real quick. Um, so lessee company A, sells gas at the wellhead to its affiliate, Gatherer A, very creative company names, I know. Um, and the price per the agreement between company A and Gatherer A is, the price paid to company A shall be the value for which Gatherer A was able to sell the gas, less any costs incurred by Gatherer A between the point of purchase from company A and sale by Gatherer A to its purchasers. So basically, they're just a pass-through, okay? And, there are, and a lot of times there will be, a, you know, any cost of return and a marketing fee of three cents in MMBTU, let's say in the case of gas. Uh, and the lease agreement states, the value of gas shall be the price received by the lessee at its point of sale. The lessee shall not deduct any costs, including but not limited to gathering, treating, transportation, processing, and marketing incurred between the well and the lessee's point of sale. Pretty sure you guys can see the problem with this. Well, under these terms, now the, the, the lessee's point of sale is the point of sale to their affiliate. And because the, the lease terms were not explicit about that point of sale being to the first third party, um, or didn't separately address if you sell to an affiliate, what should happen, the lessee now has an argument to say, well, we can deduct all these costs. And we, you know, there's stuff in Oklahoma and in some other states where you, you literally had the affiliate purchasing the gas from the lessee at the wellhead. 
And you might have had language stating that, very similar to this, you're not supposed to deduct any of these costs. Well, they purchased it at the wellhead for what we were able to sell it for less everything after that point. That was obviously a, a very clever circumvention of what the intention of the lease was. And so I think there were some lawsuits and other, other things surrounding that, and they, you, they've kind of gotten away from that, but I'm dealing with a potential case right now that's a bit more nuanced than this, but still has some issues. They've even defined affiliate sales and non-affiliate sales, and there's still even some issues there. So definitely defining your terms and ensuring what you mean by where that point of sale is and costs that are incurred prior to that point of sale and costs that are incurred quote-unquote after that point of sale and has to be at a price, that needs to be considered in the way that you write. Um, deductions. That's always that's always a hot topic. So there's always a way. One one obvious way to increase the revenues is to exclude the certain types of post-production costs in calculating those royalties. So some more common ones are obviously gathering, compression, uh, processing, transportation, and marketing. So each of these components, while they're necessary to get the product downstream. Um, I believe in the state of Oklahoma, there's the implied duty or the covenant to the market. market. So um, under that covenant, there are some, or under that covenant, the, the producer has the duty to get the gas to market um, without taking the taking costs such as these from, from royalties. And that is dependent on the area. Um, so if you're, the, the big, the primary case of this is if you have gas that needs to be processed. Yes. And you're in an area where there is no market at all for unprocessed gas. You have to process it in order to sell it. Well, it's not a marketable product in its raw form. So any cost to get it into a marketable format, residue gas and natural gas liquids, that's a cost that cannot be passed back to the royalty owner. Um, now, and, that, and that's based on the way that the lease is written. I don't, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to like speak to specific terms or anything, but there's certain ways the lease has to be written so that that's the case. Um, but it's never a bad idea, again, if, if that's what you intend to be the case, don't rely on having to sue someone <laughs> in order to get your royalties paid correctly. Make the, you know, make the lease terms spell out exactly what you want to be the case to the best of your ability and to the best of your ability to negotiate with the producer on what terms you want. Uh, always important, if you're wanting a cost-free cost, cost -free lease, if you will, including but not limited to, if you have a discrete list of items, it's very easy to say, well, this technically doesn't qualify as a compression or gathering or transportation or marketing cost or whatever, so we're going to be able to deduct it. So always, always have an included but not limited to um, uh, clause. Uh, and have you, have you seen any leases? I've seen this where I don't know if this was a specific negotiating item with the with the lessee, but where they'll allow certain costs if it's a third party, <coughs> but if it's an affiliate, they won't allow it. Yes, yeah, that's that that could be common. Um, and I don't know if the if the purpose of that is due to you know <coughs> recognizing the affiliate as, as, as under that parent company um, and not allowing certain costs um, that, that they've generated themselves or incurred um, as as themselves um, versus having to pay a third party. I don't I don't know if that that is. Well, I've heard of it. Like with one of our clients, we do some accounting for. They they acquire a set of assets, um, wells all the way through a big CO2 treating plant. And under the prior owner, you have the, you have the corporate umbrella, and you had two separate companies. One was the operator of the wells, and one was the midstream company. Well, the midstream company charged the operator some absurd gathering fee because they wanted the, the midstream company to look like a profit center. So uh, under that case, if the operator and the owner of the uh, or if you're a royalty owner, well, I 
I don't want to be subject to that affiliate rate because it doesn't reflect an actual arm's length agreement rate. So that's oftentimes why you'll see that, or or they might have, you know, you can deduct 70% of your rate or 60% of your rate or whatever the, you know, whatever the terms are. Okay, so then uh, the next topic, so we went through some language that you can consider as far as the lease language um, that's spelled out in your, in your agreements. Those are things that you, you want to consider, terms that you want to define. So, and, and going forward and talking about the more implicit stuff, so things that aren't necessarily spelled out. Um, but maybe should be. But and that's maybe kind should of the be. That's this one of the things that, that you want to point out and consider. Is, uh, so some of the implicit deductions that, that occur, like I was saying earlier, could be related to fuel usage, uh, lost and unaccounted for, flare gas. Um, basically, you know, um, when you lose gas from wellhead to sales and you've got um, dispositions that, that you can't account for, um, how, how do you determine that and how do you value that? Or do you value it? So, um, so production lost or used. On or on or after it leaves the lease is a primary example of an implied cost. An implied cost that is often not apparent on the check stub detail. So that's that's normally the I would say that's normally the case, 100 percent of the time that any review I've ever done, there's there's nothing in the in your check stub detail that will show you how much how much um, production has been lost between wellhead and sales. So you have no idea. Um, if there's unaccounted for dispositions, is there lost and unaccounted for percentage, you know, just, just beyond, you know, typically 2% is what we like to see, 2% or below. Um, is it beyond that 2% and then, you know, beyond that are those other questions, where is the gas going? Where is it being used? How is it being used? And should you be getting value for it? And, all, and you know, some, some operators, won't name names, but one in particular I know, what they, what they tend to do um, is they will say, okay, if I have wellhead and let's say I have compressor, uh, compressor fuel and then let's say raw, just raw gas sales, it's very dry. They will, they will value 100% of production at, the, at their sales price and then they'll include a deduction that is equal to the fuel volume times, they'll monetize the, the, the fuel loss. So you will see some operators do that. It might or might not be apparent that the deduction as it appears on like a check stub detail is that in particular, but that sometimes you'll see that. But very often, if you add up the, you know, eight what we call eight eighths production or gas volume, for, you know, from a check stub, and you compare it to let's say production reported to the state, well, there's several reasons why that can be different, and one of those reasons might be lease use or gas used after after the fact that's just implied that your starting point for valuation is already reduced by that. So you want to make sure, um, it's the next. yeah, so when you're designing lease language, you want to specify whether the producer can use gas, which specific types of uses or losses are allowed, and for those that aren't, you want to tell them how they're supposed to determine the value of that gas. Um, and this is a point where that I don't often see specified in leases. We've both encountered plenty of leases that say you, you owe us royalty on fuel gas. That's all it says. Well, okay, great. How do I determine, what, how are we valuing that gas? You know, what, what determines the value that you're supposed to use? And, uh, that often is dependent, in the, usually in the case of gas is where this is more relevant rather than oil, it's where that loss or use occurs. If it's, if it's residue gas that's cycled back and used for plant fuel, well in that case maybe use a residue price. If it's gas that's used in the field, well the, the concept I like to apply is, okay, if that gas hadn't been used in the field, what would have happened to it? It would have been processed. So maybe we need an equivalent per MMBTU price that reflects what would have happened to the gas if it had been processed, and that's how your royalties would be determined. So, again, you can, you can kind of balloon the language of the agreement out a lot, and you don't, we we'll talk a little bit more later, you don't necessarily want to do that, but you also don't want to sacrifice or leave 
so much ambiguity that the producer has Google room to say, oh, well, we'll just do this, and that's really not what you intended. Um, yeah, and this, just to kind of reiterate, because I run across this, and I know Mia does a bunch too, cost deducted when determining the price paid. That's you, you'll see your check stub, you'll get X dollars an MMBTU or X dollars a barrel, and it's not remotely apparent that there's any deductions taken in determining that price. So you always want to make sure in your leases that when there's terms around the price received that you're very clear about what that should be and what that means. There, I've seen some examples, and this may be the next slide, I don't know. Um, there, there's some examples where in lease language that would say, I want your gross price received before any deductions. Because at that time, you know, just, just in your example where you said, you know, I'm having to sell it to this purchaser and they're incurring deductions downstream and they're passing those back. I've seen some language that, that would explicitly state any cost, you know, incurred in getting the production to the to the to the actual purchaser, to the third party purchaser, any any post production costs incurred will be added back to that price to determine a gross a gross price received. So those are, those are some things that uh, basically to increase the value, increase that gross value, um, the language that that can be considered. And uh, in, in kind of now similar to that, I've seen some people that will say even in the case of third parties, I'll see a lot of third party agreements that state, you know, the for uh, for processed gas, let's say. Um, will pay you, we're a gas processor, we'll pay you, we're a third party, we'll pay you for your residue, some index less whatever cost of transportation we incur. Well, that, and they'll call that a net price or the sales price or something like that. I've seen a couple of leases that state if there are any deductions or costs incurred in computing the price paid to the producer by a third party or an affiliate, that's not allowed. So they're trying to, to zoom in on that, that specific language where because of the way terms are defined in a totally unrelated agreement, a processing or purchase agreement, they want to make sure that any pricing language in there doesn't allow extra costs to be lumped in um, and those agreements to be written in a way that allows the producer to deduct costs from the royalty owners that are otherwise not intended to be deducted. So that has to be considered when, when drafting the language. Um, so a little bit on transparency. Um, there, I mean, I guess it's dependent upon when you when you consider value. You know, is it is it the actual value, the dollars that are important, or is the value more related to the ability to be able to validate that you that you're getting the price that you should be getting in accordance with your terms? So when you consider transparency. That's, that could be important as far as being able to, um, one, validate the price. So is it, is it going to be, you know, close to some index basis that you can easily check on a monthly basis and say, yeah, we're in the ballpark, that looks good. Or is it in the form of, you know, you want to be able to, you know, as a nation, you want to be able to access those records that says, you know, here's my royalty provision language. I need all those records to be able to validate that you're doing that, you know, you're, you're coming up with a revenue payment that's in accordance with those lease terms. So transparency is important in that case um, to, to be able to, to check, you know, to, to identify whether or not you're getting the full value um, for what's laid out in the lease. So generally, like what's stated here, the more complex the lease terms are, you definitely have a greater chance for errors in accounting. Um, that's, that's certainly the case. A lot of operators, um, their accounting systems can't handle um, the royalty provisions that are laid out. Mm -hmm. So they have to get a little creative. They may have to do some off-ledger accounting. Some, some of the bigger companies may say that's just too much of an administrative burden. You just account for all royalties the same and then let them come audit us. You know, then we'll deal with it at that time. So that, that's a big issue. Um, on, on that note, I can't say the number of times I've written, we've written exceptions in, in reviews that we've done, and the people we audited are like, well, we just 
our, our, our accounting system won't do that. Yeah. Uh, well, that's too bad. <laughs> like you signed the agreement to figure it out. You know, that's that's not our, our client's burden for you to be able to, to do that sort of accounting. So that's an, an excuse, which it, it's understandable sometimes, but you know, it's, Particularly in, in this case, if you have large swaths of mineral acres that are all under the same lease, that's less of a viable argument because you don't have you don't have 50 royalty owners all with their own separate lease terms. You have 50 or 100 royalty owners with the exact same lease terms. So that and that gives perhaps a better negotiating position uh, for getting terms that you want in the lease. Yeah, certainly consistency. I think in this scenario would be very beneficial um, as far as across lease terms of what, of what you would want to see in those provisions. Uh, let's see. Guys. Trying to kind of wrap up. I'm just about out of time. Um, I guess kind of one of the last things, um, and this again might be something to consider for renegotiating leases, is, you know, if, if you want to be able to validate the, the detail that you get from the producers writing in specific document requirements into the lease terms. Like I said, I've seen a few large royalty owners do this where you have to provide us the wellhead meter statements and a third party sales statement. Not necessarily everything, but enough that we can see what the price I'm seeing there, how was that determined? And maybe you know, we don't need all the detail behind every single deduction, but we at least want to know these set things. Um, and that saves you from having to if they hire a third party to go in or spending a lot of your own resources or money to go in and, and time to audit uh, large swaths of information. Um, how receptive a producer gets to that is probably determined by um, how much land you have to lease or mineral acres you have to lease. Susan, tell them what the government told us last week. Well, I was just getting ready to tell them that exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to take a break. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry to, uh, hopefully this won't take very long, but we do have consultation. We sued the government several years ago, one, and four, 100 years of mismanagement of the uh, And um, we, as a consequence of the settlement, we meet with the government twice a year to figure out how we can improve things. Well, in six years, not much is improved. In fact, it's gotten worse. But, as you I have heard me say before, we are not receiving, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, and we need to work on those. So it's not a threat to our purchasers and it's not a threat to our producers because we have to work together to get the best we can for all of us. But um, I was telling the U.S. government in this consultation meeting just last week um, that uh, we are not getting market value. And they said, well, yes, you are. You're getting the value. You're getting what the producer is. That's market value. And I said, no, that's not market value. And in fact, in Osage County, we have a lot of, we've got seven gathering systems. But every single one of those gathering systems goes into some main transmission system that takes ultimately takes the gas to the market. And to me, we have set market index prices, published prices, per pipeline. So in my mind, you know, there is a market value. It's not what the gas purchaser will pay. It's not what the producer gets. It's what the market says it is. And I was, you know, we're kind of going through these iterations, and finally the guy in honor, who always comes to our meeting, said, no, 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 you don't understand. There, you know, Osage, there's the Osage price. He said, you get the Osage price. And I'm thinking, we deregulated the, you know, gas pricing, um, you know, I'm talking to the federal government, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I didn't have the presence of mind to say it, but, um, you know, they don't regulate prices anymore. There is no such thing as a postage price. Now, I don't, you know, maybe that could be approved or something, but I found that quite shocking, that the government thinks that they're at an Osage County only price. And is that like a good price in their mind, I'm assuming? Since no, they don't know that price. Okay, well, I mean, by the last, obviously not. Yes. I'm not thinking <laughs> No, that and we, you know, we produce it. We've got a lot of oil. We've got a lot of casing We've got a lot of casing and gas that has a lot of liquids in it. Is the gas processed? Somewhere. Somebody processes it eventually, but we don't always get value for it, for it, and the value that we do get is less than the opus 
probably yes. is very less. Yes. That's what I'm saying for the area. So, you know, it's a problem. It's a problem for all of us because our producers need to get that value too. Sure, sure. So, that, I mean, that was kind of a long explanation, but don't forget the real estate price. Apparently, there is one. <laughs> so, <laughs> market <laughs> price. <laughs> well, it's less than the index prices for Southern Star and for, uh, you know, one of our systems goes into DCP and three, two other pipelines. I'm, I'm just going to go on the big blank right now. But, you know, we have multiple pipelines ultimately, lane transmission lines that whose pipelines are stated in published index prices. Mm -hmm. So that gas goes in. I mean, it's not sold in Osage County. There's no end use. There's some end use in Osage County. But the majority of the gas goes outside of Osage County and is sold and processed outside. So, you know, there's very little infrastructure in the area for, for processing. So I think there's very, what I've seen, the, the plants, the processing plants are very old. Mm -hmm. um, so well, some the of them ones are shutting down and they're having to divert to, to one and, and where they can potentially just take all kind of, you know, there's, there's just more deductions that are being passed just because it's a bigger facility. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things. Which is understandable, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm not buying the OSHA price. So, but anyway, so that's all I, you know, unless anybody else has questions. Sure, yeah, any other questions? Mm -hmm. you guys get to your reception? And, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you all for coming. Yeah. yeah.